Ooh, that looks tasty. Welcome, folks. Today, the Hungry Gamer is back with another episode of Boards and Brews, and today I'm joined again by occasional regular co-host, Original Don, co-designer of the best chicken game for my money. You can be found on Board Game Geek, Backyard Chickens. Welcome back, Don. What are you drinking this morning? Everybody, it is hey, everybody. not even 10 a.m. yet where we are. No, it's 10.20 a.m. on Thanksgiving it's Day. It's 10.20, so, so perspective, yeah, we have nothing everybody. better to do, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm drinking, as usual, when we do morning recordings in Americano that I made in my fancy Nespresso machine downstairs. So. I'm having just a coffee from our Coffee of the Month Club, and I believe this is from Peru is where the coffee's from. I can't remember. And it's in my omicron protocol mug so there we go and so ever this is going to be a, a shorter episode um it's been a little while since i've just been able to convince don to take time out of his very busy day to re- talk to me he's a very important person everybody and so there's a little bit of a, of a shorter one so all we're going to do today we're going to talk about our recent plays and then we're going to wrap up by talking about two games that. I've wanted to have talked about on the show in depth. We just haven't gotten to it. Not a full-on review, kind of little mini reviews of two games at the end, and then we'll go and eat too much turkey, probably. I think it's probably the plan. Though I guess I don't have any turkey today. We're having uh, Cornish game hens today. What's on the menu for you today, Don? We don't actually have a menu today. We have uh, a get-together tomorrow with our kids and their partners, so um, I'm going to just take it easy today. So, Didn't want to travel anywhere, and yeah. Just a Taco Bell day today? I have no idea. There's there's that little of a plan. I don't even know if it's Taco Bell. Wow. Gosh. Probably I, not. Everyone is hoping that <laughs> you have the, the famous Taco Bell. To, now, apparently KFC has a whole full-on fried turkey Thanksgiving meal that you can get. So you can probably run out and grab that. I can't imagine there's You're a trend go non-traditional foods today and we'll do a turkey sandwiches tomorrow at least and weirdly they won't be leftover turkey sandwiches it will just be deli turkey yeah the the, the so, leftovers the full turkey you know you have your sandwiches and, oh gosh got everybody he's going to work I, was, I just got this full turkey i gotta get through oh carve yes. it in the break room um all right but anyhow so let's just jump, jump right in so so we actually had you and I had a little bit of a, we're not working game day on Tuesday. So I know that's where most of the games we're going to talk about recent plays are. But I do have two others that I wanted to add in that I've been wanting to talk okay. about. And I literally just played last night. And so the first one is 20 Strong from Chip Theory Games. So 20 Strong is, is kind of their, their new universe uh, of games, which you have your core game, which is 20 Strong, which comes with what's called the Solar Sentinels. But you can buy additional decks, which change up the game. And it's kind of going to be their i assume it's going to be their their new kind of new cash cow now that too many bones is officially done they're going to keep printing it but no more expansions to it and it's solo only and you're chucking a bunch of dice and you're fighting bad guys and that's about it but it is it's so fun and it's really hard so what you're doing is every every round you're going to be encountering at least in the solar sentinels version they're all a little bit different but you're encountering one of three of these like alien monsters that are on the moon you're trying to save the moon from you know evil like you do and each one has a certain amount of uh hit points that it has and has something it's going to do to you some that'll change the game state like it might be you can't use your yellow dice or something like that but then you have this big pool of 17 dice and you can roll as many as you want but However many you roll, those will be exhausted, and you won't have them moving forward, with the exception of however whatever your recovery stat is, which might be two or three for most of the game. So you'll get two or three dice back every turn, but if you roll like seven or eight dice, suddenly you've used up a huge chunk of the dice that you're using. You're kind of managing these dice as you're going. As you kill things, you get powers and bonuses. You upgrade your stats, and then you're just kind of playing through and hoping you don't die and beating the boss. It's really fun. I got to play it at origins before it was officially out it is a really cool little game and i think i think i like the too many bones deck best which means nothing to you because you haven't played it but it's a really cool game 
And it's very apropos that I talk about it now because it is one of the prizes in the Beatrice the Board Game Dog Game of the Year tournament. So if you haven't filled out your brackets, everybody, you still have time because I'm going to be taking brackets up until about November 30th. So you still got time for that. But so that's the first one I played. Don, you've heard about it, right? But you've never played it. I know of the title and what you just said, and that's the extent of my knowledge. So no, I've not. So played now it. you're an expert. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. also, it's also on sovereignty, everybody. So you can actually play it on sovereignty as well. All right. So that that that's my first one. What's the first thing you want to talk about? Uh, I'm going to start with Lahav. So this is the first game we played on Tuesday during our, you know, we're not working today game day. And uh, it was very special Inter- that we picked this game. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do, do you want to tell the people why it was special that we played this one? Oh, we had a conversation a month or so ago about games that are really special to us that we never play or something yeah, like that. Something like and that. And this was one of mine. Um, and we we decided we were going to try to play them all. I, I think we each had two games mm-hmm. um, and we're going to try to get them all played by the end of the year. So here's uh, here's one of them. Yeah, so you, you had Lahav and Clans of Caledonia. And I yes. had Euphoria and Galaxy Defenders were, were my two. Oh, so, okay. Uh, so Lahav is the classic Uwe Rosenberg game. Uh, it, it's on a lot of people's top 10 lists. It's uh, an incredibly dry Euro. I think it's from 2007. I mean, yeah, it's a good thing there's a harbor in Lahav because otherwise it would be on fire. I mean, it is. Yes. Whew, that thing is dry. Yes. Uh, so it's it's resource management at its core. Um, you're moving your ship down the the channel in the harbor, and um, every time you move the ship, some new resources come out, and you can either, on your turn after you move your ship, you know, take all of a certain kind of resource, or you can go activate a building. And at the beginning of the game, there are three buildings in the town, and then you can build buildings as you go. That's mainly what you do with those three buildings in town, is go hire somebody to build a building for you. And you can activate other people's buildings, and it's worker placement sort of but you just have the one worker i think it's actually called your person disc you can block each other so if a previous player has gone to a building to activate it you can't then go activate it until they take their disc off so, so that's I, what I gets it into the realm of worker placement like the, the amount of blocking you can do is minimal because i think by the end of the game i don't know i think i had 12 buildings and you had close to the same maybe more so the, the blocking is pretty minimal yeah, I, there were at least three or four times where I wanted to go do something and you were sitting on that building. And oh, really? I, I think, yeah. And, <laughs> and I think when you get to three, <laughs> I think when you get to three, four, five players, it's a little wilder. And, um, uh, and, and the other fun part is if you go use somebody else's building, you usually have to pay them something for that. Or if you go into town, you have to pay the town at cost. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a it, it's a really really satisfying engine building because the town gets more complex between your buildings and the buildings that the town automatically builds as time goes on and of course at the end of every round you feed your people and so there's a whole food thing and you can build ships and those ships automatically count as food so it I know it's just it's one of the most satisfying engine building games that I've played it's it's definitely a top game for me so I was really happy to get it to the table and yeah, I, for the I first was, time I, with geek up bits oh yeah it's definitely elevated the bits. experience. Yeah, so part of what determined that we were going to play this one as opposed to Clans of Caledonia was because I believe it was actually on on the episode you talked about the the geek up bits. Mm -hmm. And I said, you absolutely need to get them. And part of me on my my inside was thinking, it'll be so tragically funny if you get these bits and then we play and you're like, well, that's not really fun. Like, oh, it would have been devastating because... When you talked about there's a lot of these bits everywhere, there are so many of these little tiles. I mean, there are. it's got to be 200 tiles or more. I mean, just, yeah. It, and they're very cool. Like on one side, it says, you know, uh, wheat or grain or whatever. And then when you cook it, you flip it over, it says bread. So it's very cool. The game itself, I thought the game was actually a lot of fun. It's one, I tend to shy away from R- Rosenberg titles just because they're so dry. Mm. I mean, Oh look! Here's some small town in some place. Make sure you feed your people. You know, like, <laughs> and and to be fair, this is a small town in a place, and we have to feed our people every round. But it was really satisfying. the The only complaint, and I only played once, the only complaint that I could think of that I wish was different was down the channel in the middle of the board, where it kind of seeds the board with resources. 
there's the mystery in Discovery, the first round, because you don't know what's going to be there. But then from there on out, it's always the same. And I just wish that there was more of those and it kind of changed up. But, you know, real Euro people are like, I don't want randomness in my game, you know. But it was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. It's I would definitely Wait, play that a, one again. We'll have to bring it to the next con or whatever. There's a tiny bit of randomness in the setup. And that yeah. there's a huge deck of special buildings and you just put like six in to the game. And then there's uh, you take out a few of the standard buildings at the beginning. And you don't know what they are until you lay out the uh, the little stacks. Yeah, it, it was very, it was very, very cool. I don't think I want to play it at five. I think it just... it'd be pretty long. Yeah, like, uh, I just think it would. First time so I played long. this game, the learning game, it was hours long, and that was at three. Uh, I mean, I think we were close to with just two of us. It was an hour forty five minutes or something like that. Hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. It was so hour forty, it, I think. Yeah, and I thought it would be way faster, but it, it wasn't. We, we we both wanted knowing how to play, and so all of that. All right, so that's Lahab, one to be played again. Success on our get these games played, and you're you are allowed to still love that game, Don. That's okay. I think that's what, what we're taking away from this. Quite a relief. Yeah, you're very terrified. Uh, so my f- next one I wanted to talk about that I just played last night also is Freelancers from Plaid Hat mm-hmm. Games. This is the follow up to Forgotten Waters, except instead of pirates, instead of wacky pirates, you are wacky adventurers in this post-apocalyptic world. There's no humans, but there's just enough human technology left for lovely anachronisms as you're going through and it's the same idea it's a story-based game where it's fully narrated audio and you're moving through the story and as you go through the story you're trying to gain experience for your characters and this is cooperative and you gain experience for your characters by just doing different things each character is totally different it might be you find a treasure and you use the treasure at a campsite and then boom you get experience but kind of the fun around it is, is each of the characters you make, you choose a race. So last night I was a dwarf and I was a dwarf. And then you choose a profession. My profession was dung merchant. So I was a dwarf dung merchant last night. And you have to fill out a little Mad Lib style thing on your race sheet. And then that tells you your backstory as it goes through. And it's, you know, silly like Mad Libs is. But as you go through, you get to the end of the game. If you get to the end of the game, then depending on how much experience you have, you get one of two endings. And it's basically you have kind of the bad ending, which means you didn't get enough experience, and the good ending when you got a lot of experience. And it's just ridiculous, silly fun. There's very little game to it. The only game to it is when you maybe five, six, seven times throughout the game, you'll turn to a page in the adventure book, and everyone has 45 seconds to pick an action. And the action, will, it might be, one of the ones we had last night was distract the treasure golem. And so someone would have to make a certain type of check. And before they make the check, they'd get a bonus to it. So you're getting better by using skills. And it's just wacky and silly. And you and I played once. And I played a different scenario this time. And it was so dark. I mean, it was funny, but dark. Like one of the choices I got to make to make was um i could show someone justice or show them terror <laughs> like and uh, so i was like well obviously terror right it was so dark like the type of thing that might keep you up at night kind of dark so I remember the other scenario being dark at all no it really wasn't it was silly it wasn't fun dark. right yeah it was still a lot of fun and the difference between this and forgotten waters is this is faster each game session is still two two to three hours, probably. But in Forgotten Waters, that would get you through half of a scenario. This will get you through an entire scenario. And this one feels harder to me because we were not even close to winning last night. Just not even close. We got maybe 60% of the way through and we died. Hmm. But still a lot of fun. I, I really dig it. I mean, you've only played once. Well, what did you think about it? I really enjoyed this one. It's definitely a game that you, if you're tight on time, don't play this game. Go pick something else, you know, because it does take a long time to get through it. It's a chill experience unless you're apparently playing the horror movie scenario that you picked. Um, oh, it was still fun and very, very silly. Yeah. Just there was moments where it was like, 
Well, that just happened. Wow. It, it, it's just a really relaxing game. It's, it's not a fast game, so you need to have the time to play it um, and the right crowd. But I really enjoyed it. it it's a good, it's a good uh, turn on the um, Hoosier and Adventure style game. Yeah, I, I, I know they're, it's a, they call it the Crossroads series. So I, I know it's an ongoing thing. They'll have a, more down the road. I actually know a little bit about the next one. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it at all, so I'm not going to say anything. But it is an ongoing system. And I, I can only imagine that they're going to be putting a new one of these out every couple of years uh, as they go. Because it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah it, and the, the voice acting that they put into it, I think that's a lot of it. Because they get good narrators. They have atmospheric music and all, all of that that goes with it and just kind of fun choices so you don't really know what's going to happen very clever but really the gameplay comes down to you know roll some dice every now and then you know how to go all right so that, that's my, my segment what's the next one you want to talk about maybe i'll talk about one we played tuesday that was less of a success and this was first in flight uh, so this is a new game that uh, it's a Kickstarter that just arrived a few weeks ago. Um, it's by Ben Rossett and Matthew O'Malley, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it's it's all about you know early flight, you know Wright brothers and their their compatriots who were inventing air travel um, back in the early 20th century. Uh, it's a deck builder of sorts in that you're kind of building your abilities into your plane. You're, you have a deck that represents your plane pretty much. And it has basic cards that just move you forward. It has cards that represent flight problems. And there's a there's a descend card that you just have in front of you and you get to decide when to play it. And the, the whole idea is to have the longest flight. And you go around the board four times representing four years and there's different action spaces and you know, it's a rondelle kind of thing. You can go as far as you want and take that action, but you can't ever go backward. And when you land on the test flight thing, you're laying out cards one at a time to represent testing your plane. And if you get four problems, your plane crashes. You have to put your worker down and lose some time standing them up later. Uh, if you do not crash and you successfully descend, you count up how, well, either way, you count up how far your plane went, and then you move your little flight record tracker to show that that's your new record assuming you went further. Sometimes you don't. Uh, it was, it's an interesting design. It's, you know, very logical. I think actions were easy to understand. You know, you can fix your plane, you can upgrade your plane, you can get friends that give you a little ability. So it's got all the right pieces. I don't think we had a great first experience. I know you didn't. Um, it, it's yeah, pretty luck you know, based. I, I try very hard when I'm playing games not to be, even if I'm not having fun to be negative, because that's just, Especially if someone yeah. else introduces a game, because then you know people feel bad. I try real hard, but at the end of that game, I finally had to say, "This is not fun." <laughs> and to be fair, it wasn't fun, not because of the design, because when you described it at the beginning, I actually thought I was going to enjoy it a lot. But my luck was just so bad; it became no longer fun. And because I think it's eight flights, maybe I did. Which is a probably you know, but probably about the same as you. You know, you, you might have done nine. You know, very very Sounds close. About so right. I, yeah. And I think literally on six of them, well, I definitely crashed on six of them. I think, but on almost all of those, in the first five cards I laid out, out of my by the end of the game, maybe thirty card deck, two or three of them were problems. But of course, you cannot win the game if you don't go far. So I had to just push it because I was behind. And at the end, the end game, I lost by two. So I was actually close. But it just was. By the end, I was Slug. like, oh, look, there's two more problems already. Well, I guess I'm going to crash again. This is. Yay. Yeah. Um, so I it just didn't. I think it's just one of those times where it just, you know, it's like a dice game. Sometimes your luck's really bad. It was just so bad. I was like. I am no longer having fun, but it's a fast game and it is a neat design. And I would say I would, I would play it again. Just, I'd be prepared to be grumpy. And then maybe you'll have, you'll be pleasantly surprised. You have uh, possibly. A like, game. So I, I don't have a problem with the game itself. Um, yeah. I think it does some really interesting things. I think the only flaw that might be there is maybe there needs to be a little more, some kind of mitigation, or perhaps I just am the unicorn that just has that, wow that just happened experience and i know our 
friend and designer Johnny Pack, he always talks about how if something comes up once and he tries never to say, well, that was an outlier because the first time that game goes out there, it's going to get played a thousand times the first day. So it's going to happen. And so it might just be, it happened to me, but that, it, it, it was, it was rough. <laughs> it was a rough experience. Yeah, and, and I'll say that um, I won by two points and almost all of my flights were successful. Like, I think I crashed once, maybe twice. I think just once. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, the, the end results, like I said, it was fine, but it just, it just, the yeah. way I got there just I, wasn't fun. I, it's like, like I, don't a, know how... I, I crossed the finish line. It was just like a burning, rolling <laughs> engine. And I was like holding on to the engine. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I think my point is that it's not super satisfying to mostly have successful flights and then just barely win. Uh, oh, so, yeah. You should have crushed me. I guess fly right? better. I don't so, know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, I'm keen to try it a couple more times, at least, um, and see how it goes. But it was uh, it was a rough first experience, I think. I wonder if it would be if we would have a better experience with four players, like actual human yeah. players. Um, yeah, or even just three human players. There, there's a bot that plays along with you, and it wasn't there, there wasn't a lot of maintenance there. It's just a, a person that's there, and they take up spaces along the way, and they automatically extend their flight record, so you have to keep progressing or they're going to beat us both, but um, yeah, I'd like to play it with three human players and see if that's different. So, it was quick. Yeah, yeah. that's all I got. Um, but I, 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 I'll I, jump in with one more from our game day, just because it must be said. I got to knock Euphoria off of my games that I love that I never play list, and it was interesting because uh, Neither of us remembered how to play as much as we thought we did at the beginning, so there was a little bit of a slow start to it. But I, I had a great time with it. I I like the way the dice workers work. I love the way that you know there, there's that luck to it. Like very early on, I got a third worker, and then very early on, my workers got too smart, and I lost one like almost right away, which was maddening. But you know that's on me because I I knew the risks. I think it's a really clever game. I I like the little fun story bits that are in there. If you stop and pay attention, like we had the symphony of discord or something like that, which, you know, did the symphony of discord and melodies or just, it's always just ridiculous stuff, but I thought it was great. And we had a really close game, like super oh, close right. game, which I found so satisfying. And I think we were both playing very different strategies too. So it's, it's yep. definitely that kind of game. Yeah, completely different, and to where it came—I mean, I think it came down to a, to the second tiebreaker was was a, how the winners. Oh, so we both right. actually placed our tenth star on the same turn. We actually had to go to a tiebreaker. That's which, right. Uh, um, oh no, it was a very, it was happiness. My my people were happier, and your your people were both dumb and unhappy. So I don't know what your. I still think I should win that tiebreaker. People are <laughs> dumb and unhappy. And I still tied you. Yeah, you, you, you dumb and not happy workers. You see, still, you still made it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled with that game. I would, I would buy another expansion for that game if it came out. I just, and there's so much variety in all the different recruits you can have, the cards you can have, the different tiles out there. It's just, it's just so clever. So yeah. I think it's an underappreciated game. Really. Yeah. It up until maybe now. It was my favorite Stonemeyer game. I might like Expeditions better. I don't think I do, but maybe, maybe. So let's. And you know, we've played a lot of Tapestry. I played a lot of Scythe. Red Rising was fine, but it didn't really hold on to me. And um, Pendulum didn't really work for me, but that was only because I was playing that at two players at the time, and it's mm -hmm. it's not a great low low player count game. But yeah, I really like it. I love it. I want to kind of want to put it on my table right now and play again in the solo because it's got a very good solo mode as well. But I think I'm allowed to still still like that game. I, th I think that was a success. One. Um, so we played. We can probably talk about it more after we've gotten further. We played Ticket to Ride Legacy the first um, session with our wives Tuesday night, and then after that we had one more short game in us and we played abandon all artichokes and i think this was your first time playing that yep yeah but both right? mine mine and sarah's first time yeah and it, it's a favorite around here it's a super light i think they refer to it as a deck deconstruction game because you start with a deck of of 10 artichoke cards and you're trying to be the first one to draw a new hand that has no artichokes in it and there are other vegetables that you draw on on your turn you draft a 
vegetable from the row, add it to your hand, and then you play any cards that you can from your hand. And some of them let you compost artichokes. Some of them let you interact with other players. And it's just a light, breezy experience. It takes like, maybe 10 minutes to play. Yeah. Um, and I love the origin story of it. Emma Larkins, the designer, was brainstorming alliterative titles on the bus one day and tweeting them out to her followers and people immediately said they wanted to buy abandoned hall artichokes and so she's like i guess i better go design it now uh so it's, it's a it's, it's a neat little fairly story. successful i think even shut up and sit down yeah. I think, covered it also maybe but yeah you, you hear it mentioned quite a bit yeah and, it, it was, uh, it's it was a very little clever. 10 game and yeah yeah I, so it's I, I just thought i'd I, mention I, that I one. Hope, uh next next con you you, you bring that because that was very very quick very fun and Absolutely. yeah my wife liked it a lot the art's super cute it's got super cute yeah. little veggies with arms and just and, very, very yeah. cool and and let's not forget that the entire game your wife was saying this is not how you play the game to win you don't win by playing this way this is not how you do it who won the game she won the game just strategy oh man she psyching you out yeah she wasn't a threat i was like well she's clearly not a threat because then she was explaining why she wasn't a threat and i was like that makes sense i buy that and totally had me totally had me she probably wins that game all the time but all right so last thing here what what, what is next to be played for you next for me is tanaris adventures because as people may know i am currently working through my game of the year and i have to replay all the games which is why one of the reasons i do my announcement of my nominees in november so i have time to, to replay all these games to really side where does they land because sometimes games show up at the beginning of the year and that kind of gives late year games an advantage because you know i've been playing them more so it's exciting so tanaris adventures huge huge dungeon crawl campaign and it's it, it's it's massive it's just huge it's like i have more boxes of that than anything else and i say i got one two three i got four boxes of this stuff and i wish it was less i would apparently they have a standee version out now so now i'm mad about that i wish i had that but that's the next one I have to play, kind of, and this was it's actually the last one of my game of the year nominees. I have to actually play significantly. I do want to play one more game of Tales from Red Dragon Inn, but the last one I haven't played in a while. To kind of put it together. It's a really cool game. It's a cool system. Does neat stuff. Has a neat little kind of mini deck building game in between each adventure as you're building up your city. Very cool game. I like it a lot. Some of the backers are current backers are angry because apparently the shipping was very expensive. But I don't know why anybody's surprised, because like I just said, I got five boxes of stuff. But whatever. All right, so that's my next one. What's your next game, Don? It's a good question. I, I'm sure we will play some games tomorrow when when I've got everybody gathered. Um, we'll depend on the mood. You know, it's possible I will get some of the kids to play first in flight just to see how that goes. Um we like that just to start off here, your so. Thanksgiving celebration with a bang. <laughs> That's right. Uh, on the flip side, I recently got Age of Comics, which was a Kickstarter last year. Oh, you and, have that? Um, oh, I have. I yes. almost. I've been seeing it a lot. I almost used a gift card I had to buy that. I mm -hmm. wasn't interested in that, really, when we talked about it with Danny and Doug. But I've been seeing it lately. I'm like, oh man, that actually sounds really good. That sounds really good. Yeah. But you have it good, so now I'm safe. Yes. I'm really intrigued by it. I, I unboxed it right after it came. I don't ever leave things in shrink. I, I just love the process of organizing the game and I'll go as far as reading setup just to know how to put things away so that setup is better. Um and I'm really impressed with the component quality. It looks really neat. Um I don't remember what the gameplay is like from from back when I backed the game, but uh I'm anxious to learn that one and get it to the table. And so if we're feeling thinkier tomorrow, then that'll be the game that I try to push. All right, everybody. This is the part of the show where I say, become a channel member. It's great. All right. So let's jump in. So we each have two, we call them kind of mini reviews here. One, because I can't really talk too much about the one you're going to talk about. You can actually talk about the one I'm going to talk about. Two games that we've said well, we've talked about one that we should talk about on the channel for about a month and a half now. And this other one I've been meaning to make content for. I just haven't done it. So those are Dinosaur Island, Roar and Write, and 
Dawn of Ulos, Dinosaur Island being from Pandasaurus, Dawn of Ulos being from Thunderworks games. And let's start with Dawn of Ulos. Dawn. Oh, Dawn of Ulos from Dawn. Sure. Uh, so Dawn of Ulos from Thunderworks game designed by Jason Lentz, who uh, is a friend. Uh, he is a designer from here in the Bay Area. He now lives in Sweden, but got to know him over a few years. Um, I have played this game, I don't know how many times, um, mostly in playtests back when he was bringing it to different playtesting meetups in the Bay Area. It was called Mercenaries of Esterok at the time. And it was basically the same game. They've just taken it and put it in the Ulos universe for the, the role player universe uh, in the Thunderworks games. And I think they've done a beautiful job with the production of it. Um, I loved his version of it. his prototype was just he had access to some fancy laser cutting thing or something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but he had like this industrial sized cutout hex thing. And so it was always a lot of fun to play. There were a lot of silly games of this back in the day. Um, it is inspired by a player, which is an older investment game. Uh, I'm blanking on the designer, but it's one of those legendary designers from yeah, the seventies. It's classic. It's one of it's, that's, I think there's been like five different companies that have had it in print. Yeah. In the, you know, Sid Saxon, I think. I think it's a Sid Saxon game. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and before so I, so I, I haven't played yeah. it, but I have seen it and yeah. it is a very nice production. It really is. It's got some very cool, cool minis with the, that are kind of like this, like half body of the faction that you're supporting and like terrain around them on these like, triple hex thing very very cool very cool yeah and so acquire is about real estate investing um and, and i'll confess i have not played acquire i have had a an old 1970s copy of it for a long time now and just have not gotten it to the table and i'm kind of itching to do that but um acquire is based on that but you're investing in mercenary factions in a fantasy universe um they all are of course because it's in the role player universe they're the races that you find in the different stories there. Um, and each one has an affinity for two different types of, of um, terrain. And their power is based on the space that they're connected to and how much of those two types of terrain are in it. And if you ever connect the the terrain or the spaces that the, uh, the two races are connected to, they fight. And everybody's got cards that they've drafted of those races. And you secretly play a certain number of one or both of the factions, and then whoever wins takes over the whole area. Their value goes way up. Whoever loses goes to zero, and they're off the board until somebody brings them back in. And that's kind of the, the routine of the game. It's uh, th There's a lot more to it, but um, basically you are investing in the different mercenary factions. Uh, you, you are not playing as one of those factions. You're investing in them. You're collecting cards that represent players in the factions and when they win battles it pays off so the more cards you contribute the more you're going to have to give up right at that moment and you, you have to sell them to the market um one of the fun things about it is there are no it feels like every action is a no regret action because anytime you play a card for its special ability you get the value of that card back so it's not costing you what you paid for that card you're getting the value and every time you put one in a fight, you're getting the value back, or you get to keep some of them if, if you play it a certain way. Uh, so that's a very thumbnail sketch of the game, but uh, it, it is a beautiful production. I am very, very slowly painting the minis for it. Uh, and you're... Well, and let, let's be clear. How many games have you painted minis for, Don? Uh, this would be the first, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it, and everybody, Don's starting to go deep. I hope so we're at his house, and there are a lot more paints in that collection than last time I was there. So it's, it's begun. I keep finding a new feature. I need to paint and I have to go find another color. So yeah, <laughs> I, I need to find something else to justify the number of little bottles of paint that I now own. So a lot of them are Adrian's. He had, he, he got into painting in a big way a few years ago and collected a bunch of stuff and then went on to other hobbies. But uh, yeah, it's been fun. It's just slow. Yeah. I'm slow. Yeah. So th this is one that. So I've heard about Acquire, and it, you know, I'm very, theme is very, has a huge effect on me. Like, oh, boy, real estate. Oh, boy. Yay. Yeah. So this one's a little more interesting to me. And it, it's one that I almost recommend that we play, but also I don't think that's a game that is going to shine at two players, is my guess. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. 
Yeah, so I haven't experienced it, but I this feels better with three or four. Yeah, and uh, it was played at Powdered Wigcon, but I had to. I, I was in the process of resetting the kitchen for the next round of food, and it took the length of teaching and playing a game of Dawn of Ulos is is how long it took. So I, I missed out on that one. But and so this has been a little bit also on my mind because their new marketing person, content creator, connect person that sure that's not a real title from thunderworks game her name is jess and she's been so nice and she's reached out and asked me if i wanted to cover dawn of ulos and i said well we'll talk about it you don't need to send me a copy because don already has the greatest painted copy in the world so we don't need another one another. but uh, she, she's been very very nice just in general and just super kind so i'm happy to actually talk about it because Nice people should be rewarded. Absolutely. Speaking of nice people, I, I forgot to mention Jason, who designed this game, designed the solo mode for Backyard Chickens. And it was not something we asked for. We hadn't really strongly considered a solo mode. And he just sent me a message one day and said, I have an idea for a solo mode. Do you mind if I do it? And it turned into something that became a free print and play add-on for the game when the Kickstarter launched. We, you know, we wanted to give it a little more development time, so it wasn't something that made it into the box. But um, I appreciate him doing that. He's been such a big supporter. And so there's all of my biases around this ta this game on the table, but uh, I have played it many times. I backed it, and I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, you like it so much, you got two copies of it, right? That's right. He did send me a copy after I'd already backed it. So, uh, yeah, I'm still trying to find a home for that. All right, so, and then the... Other one, as it says, Dinosaur Roar and Write. And you can actually talk a little bit about that because because you've played this one. And so mm -hmm. the premise behind this is you're building your dinosaur park a la Jurassic Park. And it's done through dice drafting. You're going to roll a bunch of dice, be able to do a snake draft, and you'll get whatever's on the die. Usually it's going to be some kind of DNA. Might be a ride that you can build in your park, or it might be a merch stand or whatever. And the different types of places you might build, the rides and the merch stand, they're going to give you bonuses at the end of every season. So three times a game, you get bonuses, coins, whatever. But mostly you're getting DNA, and you're using this DNA to make dinosaurs. When you make a dinosaur, you're going to make a dinosaur paddock. And all of these things you're going to draw onto your grid, very Tetris style. But you can't touch them. They can't be touching because that's crazy pants. You can't have a T-Rex and a Diplosaurus sharing a fence. That's just crazy. So can't do that. So the other things you're going to be building, you're going to be building roads that are going to be connecting each of these different things to each other and then to an exit. Because the goal is you want people to come through your park. And at the end of every season, which is every two turns of drafting, people are going to come through. And if you have roads connecting, you're going to take the longest path you can. They're going to go through all these different uh, features of your park and they're going to get to see things that's going to build excitement and when you're building putting dinosaurs out you're going to build excitement but you're also going to put out threat because it's also dangerous to be doing this stuff and so the other thing that you're going to be getting is you're going to be getting security to keep that threat managed and if you don't keep the threat managed people start to die and so at the end of every round you're also going to put out how many people died and if too many people die some kind of disaster happens you take a big old penalty and of course for every dead person in the game, you're going to lose a point because that's all we're worth is one point in a game where you're going to be getting oh, over 100. So you, one life is worth less than 1% of your, your profit. It feels very, very all. right to me in the yes. world of theme parks. And the only other thing is there's a set of actions. So not only do you draft dice, you're going to take those dice and you're going to put them on the board and do some kind of action, which might be create dinosaurs. It might be build some roads, get some money, et cetera, et cetera. That's kind of the high level overview here. And this came out right around the time that like all of the heavier roll and write started coming out. You know, right around then we had you had Hadrian's Wall. Not too much later, you got Twilight Inscription. Like just kind of mm -hmm. all in the same. This is that era of game. So I think you had mentioned that you like this game a lot. So I'm gonna let you start. Sure. I, I think what I like about it, so I have, we're big fans of Dinosaur Island. We've had that from early on in our, you know, modern game 
hobby in our house and really love it as a worker placement engine building game. Um, they got Dinosaur World at the same time as this game. I think they came in the same Kickstarter. Uh, the, the dino, oh, is this one? Because uh, Dinogenics and Dinosaur Island came out at the same time. Yeah, Dinosaur World was the follow-up big, big game to Dinosaur Island. Oh, and, I didn't even know that was a thing. And I believe Roar and Wright was an add-on that campaign. Um, it's possible I'm remembering that wrong, but I think it was. And so both came at the same time. I think I had played Dinosaur World and the kids and I played Dinosaur Raw and Right um, and like really enjoyed it. One of the things I really like about it is it takes some of the best elements from Dinosaur Island and Dinosaur World, which are pretty different games. They're like same theme, but different style. And it takes elements from both and puts them into this smaller, lighter, quicker game. And I, I really enjoy the flow of it. It's been a little while since I played, but um, it's just it's quick to get to the table. Turns are snappy. You get through it pretty quickly. We've really enjoyed it. Yeah, it, it is. It is very quick. And the, the solo mode is fairly satisfying. Also, it's just a beat your own score, which is never my favorite. But I'm more forgiving of beat your own scores and roll and writes for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I don't know what that is. But in rolling, I, 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 I'm like, okay, that's fine. I think it's a smaller investment. Yeah, time yeah. wise and all that. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll buy that. Yeah, I I enjoyed it. it it's fun. I I like the the way the dice work and the drafting of the dice. And I do like I like rolling dice. It's always fun. And I like the way that you're using the dice and then you have those set actions. So if there's something that you really need, and you're not getting it on the dice, you can go get it. And you can even get it if someone's already there and taking the spot, though there is a little bit of a penalty, there's a little more danger or threat, whatever it's called, that shows up. I, I like that. And I, I like the I like most of what it does. The thing that I like a little less is I'm such a bad artist. I feel like my park looks stupid. Mm. Because I have to draw and there's just shapes. I know they're just shapes. I have that problem. But even my shapes look bad. <laughs> and so I look at my park at the end and I'm like, I, I played another game uh, last night. Um, well, two more games last night, actually. And I was looking, I was like, this does not look like a 160 point park. No, no. This is like the spirit airlines of dinosaur parks. You got that trailer so, park, dinosaur park. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I also like this, you know, the Tetris shapes, but like you mm -hmm. don't actually Tetris them really. Because the game's so you're not short, them together. Yeah, yeah, the game's so short, you're not going to run out of space. It's not you're never going to be like, oh, I can't build anything now. No, you can build something. It's always going to happen. Like you could That's almost true. double the length of the game, and you'd still not run out of space. But it, it's it's clever. I think it's worthy right up there with all the others. It's not my favorite of the heavier rolling rights. I still like Hadrian's Wall more. I like Twilight Inscription more, though. I, I don't play that a lot because that's actually that's like a long rolling right. Yes. And I forget the name of it, but there's one of the Valeria games is similar to a Hadrian's Wall. It's like a Hadrian's Wall light. And I think I probably like that one a little bit better, too. But I say all that. It sounds like I don't like this game. It was a fun game. Like next mm -hmm. next time I'm over, we should and we have time. We should play it again because it is very clever. It's very clever. I just can't draw. Yeah. So one other thing I was going to mention about this game is when uh, Pandasaurus announced the game, they they said, "Hey guys, we're going to come out with a roll and write companion game called Dinosaur Island Roar and Write." And it wasn't Roar. It wasn't R A W R. It was just Roar and Write. And a couple of people pointed out to them that Weird Draft Games had just launched the game Roar and Write. And it's about wild animals. It's not about dinosaurs. It's not the same theme. It was just the same title. And Pandasaurus just immediately said. Okay, we'll rename it. It's now Rar and Right. And I just thought that was a classy move. You know, it is. And also a better name for dinosaurs. It is more fun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, definitely. So I, I don't know. I just wanted to mention that, you know, kudos to them for not pushing back. I mean, there aren't really any big companies when it comes to board gaming, but Pandasaurus is definitely a more prominent one. Yeah. And I mean, you, so, you got, let's see. Yeah, I, I would say you got, you got Chip Theory Games are bigger, Arcane One Wonders is bigger. Yeah, but none uh, of these know. are big companies in yeah. the grand scheme of things in the corporate world. But uh, just, you know, it's classy to say to, you know, if you're a real jerk, you could say, yeah, they're not really competing with our game. We're going to stick with this title because that's work to change it. And they just immediately changed it. And I thought that was great. 
He yeah. does. Yeah. 10 out of 10 for that. All right. So that brings us to the end of our longer than anticipated episode, but still relatively short episode. And so to finish this off, as always, Don, what are your gaming? You forgot again, didn't you? I totally forgot. <laughs> what are your uh, gaming words of wisdom? I don't know that I have much this time. Uh, you know, there, there was a post online that worked to me a couple of days ago and somebody talking about how there's too much positivity in this, in this hobby. And I thought it was a weird comment and they, they felt the need to elaborate on that. And lots of people piled on, you know, and it's the usual thing. Like there, there's too much positivity around games and nobody ever criticizes anything. And I think that's nonsense to begin with. Um, but, you know, to talk about being people being too positive in this day and age is super weird to me. And, you know, I my one little comment on that thread was like, not a day goes by that I don't see two or three posts in the various board game Facebook groups that are something along the lines of what is the most overrated game in your opinion? What's the game that disappointed you the most? And there's just heaps and heaps of negativity in this hobby. And, you know, maybe it's coming from players and not the content creators, but I think it's at least balanced at best. Well, I'm probably skews negative in terms of just the general conversation. So I don't know. Take the positivity and then make up your own mind. Don't criticize people for speaking positively about something. That's that's all. That's my little bit of wisdom. Yeah, you should, you shared that post and it talked about toxic positivity. And I, I didn't go and dive in because sometimes You're I go down for rabbit it. holes and it's bad. Yeah. Like, that is not what toxic positivity means, sir. I have worked in places that have toxic positivity, and let me tell you, that is not it. Yeah, um, yeah I, you know, I've thought about, people have talked to me often, not not you, about how I should, when I review things, I should be blunter and meaner. Yeah. And, I mean, I could, and I'd probably get more views and subscribe, I get a lot of subscribers, you know, just set that game on fire. But for me, you know, I just don't feel like when someone has put years of their life into a game, mm. I don't have to be mean about how I critique it. Right. Like, I mean, I'm still going to say, I, well, like we talked about the first in flight, like, it didn't work for me. I didn't have fun with that. But I'm not saying it's a horrible thing. And no, like, it just, you know, that didn't work. That was a bad experience. Um, and that was about as mean as I've ever been about a game, I think. That's so hard. sorry, first in flight. Everyone, give it, you, make up your own mind about it. But yeah, I, I just don't see the need for that. And I think when, and I also think because as creators, as they get bigger and more important, i.e. not me, but for some of them, saying a game just sucks can legitimately tank a company. And, you know, you can decide, well, do you know, do you, do you think that's worth it or not? And you can say, well, maybe do your research on who you're sending games to, what kind of games are they like? But, you know, it's when that's done without caveat or without thoughtfulness around it, it's like, okay, yeah, I didn't like this game because this, this, and this, not this game is trash, it should be burned. You know, there, there's a lot there's a lot that goes on behind it. And I think as some of us get more important, and I can't wait till I'm that important, but some of us get more important, you know, we forget that, you know, there there is a human cost behind these things. And so we should need to be honest, I think. But we don't have to be jerks about it. You know, these are board games. Like this is not Congress. All right, everybody. Well, have a well, you're not hearing this on Thanksgiving, probably. Maybe you are, but if you celebrate Thanksgiving, hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, I hope you had a good meal. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, share, maybe become a channel member. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.